welcome back to the Presbyterian Journey. I'm the Reverend Lucas Levy Keppel, and I am your guide on these rapids of discovery. Like a raft on the river, we're not going to stay in any one place for too long. So if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below, or check with your pastor. I'm sure they'd love to offer you more resources than I can offer here. Last week, we were in Juneau, Alaska, discussing the organization of the presbytery and how mission in the church has changed over time. This week, we're back to the east coast of the United States, in the bustling metropolis of New York City, primed to hear all about the fundamentalist modernist controversy. While we're waiting in the gallery for the debate to begin, let's talk about what makes up local church governance, which we call the session of the church. The session is made up of congregation members who have been elected and ordained as ruling elders. They are responsible for the governance of the local congregation. Each session must be moderated by a teaching elder, also called a minister of word and sacrament, or by a commissioned pastor authorized to moderate by the presbytery. Any ordained elder in the church, whether currently serving on session or not, may be elected to the session to serve as its clerk of session, a position of service and leadership within the church. A session is given three main tasks. Provide that the word of God may be truly preached and heard. Provide that the sacraments may be rightly administered and received, and to nurture the covenant community of Christ's disciples. To provide that the word of God may be truly preached and heard, the session is responsible first for ensuring that there is a regular worship space. In most cases, this is a church building, but it may be a local school gym or a park, or it may be sharing living space with members of the congregation. Next, the session is responsible for hiring church staff, such as directors of Christian education, directors of music, office administrators, and sextons or janitors. If a new pastor is needed, the session authorizes a pastoral nominating committee, but the call of a pastor is one of the few things that the congregation as a whole must vote on. For the word of God to be heard, community needs must be met, and so the session is responsible for planning and leading events and mission to the local community. Lastly, sessions are encouraged to maintain efforts to bear witness to God's love and grace in the ecumenical community working together with other churches instead of seeing the church as competition. This second major task of the session is to provide the sacraments. Communion must be offered at least quarterly, and baptism must be available as appropriate. In churches without a minister of word and sacrament, this can become tricky, so ruling elders may be commissioned by the presbytery. These commissioned pastors may provide the sacraments in their congregation, but they're not normally authorized to serve any other place than their local congregation. Lastly, the session is responsible for nurturing the covenant community of Christ's disciples. To this end, the session is responsible for pastoral or congregational care, whether or not there is a called and installed pastor in the church. In many cases, the session delegates pastoral care to a board of deacons, but that is ultimately the decision of the session. Additionally, sessions receive or dismiss members, train, examine, ordain, or install ruling elders and deacons, lead the congregation in participating in the mission of the whole church, and serve in judicial matters in accordance with the rules of discipline. Historically, sessions are also charged with bearing witness against error in doctrine and immorality in the congregation and the community. This means that the session is authorized to make statements com commenting on social issues, whether through the church or in the media. In everything the session does, it is considered to be acting as a whole. Session members should not talk about uh, which members voted in which way, and if there is a dissent with an action, it should not be voiced publicly by session members, only within the session meetings themselves. While sessions must meet at least quarterly and maintain records and budgets, these records uh, should not record who voted for or against any motions, though they may record who moved and seconded a motion if so desired. 
Now, I'm sure you're wondering why we're setting this episode in New York City. So let's turn our attention to the fundamentalist modernist controversy. In 1891, Union Seminary in New York appointed Charles Briggs to the position of Professor of Biblical Theology. While appointing a professor to a new position usually goes unremarked in the national media, uh, Briggs's inaugural address caused major headlines across the country as he directly talked about the implications of the relatively new historical critical method of biblical hermeneutics and directly attacked Princeton Seminary's continued teaching of the doctrine of scriptural inerrancy. Briggs was one of the first Americans to talk about the historical critical method, which was sweeping the German-speaking world at this time. This method of looking at the Bible questioned a traditional view about who wrote the Bible, noting, for instance, that although Moses is traditionally responsible for writing the Torah, Deuteronomy 33-34 through 34 discusses the circumstances of his death in detail. In the scriptural inerrancy model, Moses either received a vision of his death, and so wrote it down ahead of time, or a later author wrote a conclusion to the book. The historical critics, like Briggs, preferred to focus on deeper or allegorical meanings of scripture, allowing room for the Bible to diverge from history. In his inaugural address, Briggs said, There are errors in scripture that no one has been able to explain away, and the theory that they are not in the original text is a sheer assumption. Because this statement was so controversial, the General Assembly voted in 1891 to veto his appointment at Union Seminary. And Union, rather than agreeing to remove him, refused, citing scholarly freedom, and they decided instead to withdraw from the denomination. Briggs was tried for heresy in the Presbytery of New York. He was acquitted by that body, and then tried again by General Assembly in 1893, which overturned the acquittal and defrocked him. Charles Briggs was subsequently ordained by the Episcopal Church and continued teaching at Union Seminary for 15 years. Meanwhile, despite Briggs' defrocking, the historical critical method continued to gain adherence and cause Presbyterians and Christians of all types to think about their faith in new ways. In 1910, New York Presbytery again pushed the boundaries of the denomination by ordaining three men that did not assent to the doctrine of virgin birth. In response, the General Assembly issued a statement that five doctrines are necessary and essential to faith, condemning the ordination and setting limits on who could be ordained going forward. It is from these five fundamentals that the fundamentalists derived their name. A man named Lyman Stewart was one who picked up the fundamentalist torch, publishing 12 pamphlets between 1910 and 1915 that were critical of higher criticism and added additional fundamentals to the original five. His pamphlets were widely reprinted and formed the basis of fundamentalist arguments for years to follow. In 1922, First Presbyterian Church of New York invited the Baptist Harry Emerson Fosdick to preach. His sermon, entitled Shall the Fundamentalists Win, presented liberal modernist theologians as sincere evangelical Christians trying to make sense of science and history along with theology. He presented fundamentalists, then, as arbitrarily drawing the line to what was off-limits to religious discussion. This sermon was packaged as a pamphlet and mailed to every Protestant pastor in the phone book in the United States. At the General Assembly the following year, the election for moderator was very close between a staunch fundamentalist named William Jennings Bryan and a modernist president of Worcester College, Charles Wishart. Bryan, who had run for U.S. president three times and had been Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, was proposing that the Presbyterian Church should not support schools that taught the theory of evolution. Bryan lost the election to moderator, 
though he would go on to argue uh, for the prosecution in the famous Scopes Monkey trial. And the General Assembly spent a year of study and prayer, returning in 1924 with the Auburn Affirmation. The Auburn Affirmation argued that Presbyterianism has a long tradition of freedom of interpretation, and that the five fundamentals imposed from the General Assembly flew in the face of that tradition. The Auburn Affirmation was approved by the Presbyteries, and in 1926, the denomination encouraged toleration of doctrinal diversity, establishing that GA cannot amend the confessions without Presbytery assent, but can issue binding judicial rulings within the existing confession. That meant they couldn't list new fundamentals to be uh, adhered to unless all of the Presbyteries agreed to such a thing. Now, I know that the fundamentalist modernist debate is a lot more detailed than what we've covered before, but it sets the stage for many of the schisms within the church over the next century. For instance, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, formed in 1936 from a group within the denomination, who saw these actions as diluting the Reformed tradition. Similarly, the Presbyterian Church in America, PCA, formed in 1973, breaking from the denomination primarily over the ordination of women. And the Evangelical Presbyterian Church split off in 1981, citing a need to create a list of essential tenets and a restriction in the role of pastors in the General Assembly. Our timeline is filled with convoluted splittings and joinings, but I do hope that one day we will all be back together as one. That's all for this week, and I hope that this series of the Presbyterian Journey continues to be useful for you. Next week, we'll be heading back for a brief foray into Europe in the 20th century this time, and looking into the origins of the Barman Declaration of 1934 in the midst of Nazi Germany. As always, may the Holy One guide your path along this Presbyterian journey, and thank you for joining me.